In this video, we focus on how to modulate different gene expressions. So I want to start with just a simple overview of when this might be useful. So the reason that gene modulation is such an important skill in the lab is because if you're trying to establish a function for a gene, then you cannot simply establish it by saying that that gene is elevated when something is happening. That's correlation, not cause. And so the way you establish that the gene is an actual cause of something is by either knocking it down and looking at how it changes things or by overexpressing it and looking at how it changes things. And so this means that we have to be able to specifically modulate that gene's activity in our cells and then do a readout in order to really robustly tie it to a certain function. And that means that gene modulation comes up all the time in the lab. It's one of the key skills. You're always doing it, and it's a key part of almost every project that you will do. So it's something to understand very, very well. So this is a review from our previous lecture, and you can check out the CRISPR video to see more details on this. Today, I'm just going to go through it very, very quickly, but if you want all the information, I would encourage you to check out that video. So as a reminder, there are two things you can do to modify gene expression. You can knock it out, which is usually a CRISPR, or you can knock it down. And knockouts done with CRISPR are mediated by sgRNAs, whereas knockdowns are mediated by shRNAs or siRNAs. And it usually occurs at the RNA level, whereas this will occur at the DNA level. Remember also that any of these modifications will require plasmids. And so plasmids are these small circular pieces of DNA that have the necessary components to change gene expression. Recall that they have to be able to survive in two systems, so bacterial, because we expand them in bacteria. Bacteria are like our factory for making more plasmid and mammalian, which actually contains the expression vector you're interested in. So usually it's somewhere right here where your sgRNA or shRNA or siRNA is going to be inserted and is going to do whatever modification is necessary. You can also tie an EGFP or some sort of fluorescent marker into this promoter system so that when this is being expressed, you also have GFP output. And that just allows you to look at your cells under a microscope and make sure that your plasmid has incorporated properly. So let's talk more about how we actually do this in the lab. So plasmids are sort of vector for how we get these modifications. And usually you can generate plasmids in the lab or you can buy them from a company. And if you buy them or generate them, they're going to be saved as a glycerol stock in the minus 80. And you're going to take this stock and you're going to take just a portion of it, so maybe 50 to 100 microliters, maybe even less if it's a good stock. And you're going to grow it overnight in LB media with antibiotic. So this is the selection antibiotic that makes sure that only the bacteria that have your plasmid are going to grow. And you can grow this in whatever volume of LB media you think you'll need. So if you're doing a few mini preps, maybe you only need 25 or 50 ml. If you're doing a midi, then 100 is probably a good number. And if you're doing a maxi, then you'll follow the protocol for that. And then typically we use chiagen kits to do the preps. And the prep is basically where you purify the plasmids from the bacteria. And they come in three sizes. You can do whatever is appropriate. But typically a midi prep is a reasonable choice to generate enough plasmid that you will have some that you can keep using for the long term. So now that you've generated your plasmid, let's talk about what you can do with it. So there are two ways to put it on cells. The first way is a transfection. So this is a transient modification because you're just dumping the plasmid onto the cells, basically. It's very simple. It can be done on almost any cell, but it will only last about three to seven days. So if your experiment is within this time period and you don't want to save the cells, this is reasonable. You can do it quickly and it'll be done. But if you want to save the cells, if you think you're going to do a lot of experiments with these cells, it might be worth actually making a permanent modification. So you first prepare your reagents. It's essentially a mix of your plasmid DNA, some sort of transfection reagent. You can use anything you want. And... Um, that will create this lipoplex formation or liposome formation, which is basically a formation of the plasmid with um, 
this transfection region around it that allows it to get into the cells. You incubate this for about 20 to 30 minutes with consistent vortexing, so approximately every 10 minutes you should vortex your mix. And then you drop it onto the cells in a really nice dropwise manner where it spreads across the entire plate. So make sure it spreads cleanly and you're dropping it onto the existing media. So you don't remove the media, you just add this complex on top of it. And in terms of exact amounts, it's typically given in the protocol for whatever transfection reagent you're using, so just check the protocol. And then you wait about two to three days, I would say more like 48 to 72 hours post-transfection, and you should see transformation of your cells. And if your cells have a fluorescent reporter, you can just look under the microscope to check. If they don't, then you might need to do some sort of assay to make sure that it actually worked and your modification happened. The other way to do this is transduction, and this is a permanent modification of your cells. This is not as easy to do. It's a little bit more complicated, but it still doesn't take very long, and it can generate stable lines with your modification. So now you'll just have a stock of lines that you can constantly use to do whatever experiments you want to, and you don't have to keep transfecting over and over again. So some people find this helpful to do. So in order to do this, we're going to start with a normal transfection, right? So what we just talked about, except that this time you're going to include your plasmid of interest, which is the plasmid that has the modification, but you're also going to include two viral plasmids. And these are basically the packaging plasmids that are necessary in order to make a virus. And you're going to transfect a specific cell type. So X293s or otherwise known as 293T cells these are the cells that allow the three plasmids to transfect very, with very high efficiency and generate virus, okay? So you add these three plasmids following normal transfection protocols, but your cells should be very well spread out. They should be 80 to 90% confluent, and you want to make sure that you're using good high-quality virus. So you transfect your cells with this virus, and you wait 48 to 72 hours. And during this time, the cells will basically be infected with your three plasmids and they'll generate lots of virus particles. And then it'll lyse and release those virus particles into the media. So now we have all these little virus particles in our media. And now we're just gonna harvest the virus by basically taking the media off of the cells. So we just take this media, we put it in a tube, we spin it down to remove any debris and then we move the supernate into a new tube, and this is our virus. Some people like to concentrate this virus, and so there are protocols you can follow to concentrate it down. Some people choose to just use the media, and in most cases, I find that using the media is fine. It's sufficient to get a good infection. So once you have this tube of virus, you want to decide how much virus to add, and that's what the MOI is. We'll talk about that in a second but it's basically just how much virus do I want to add to my cells. And then you take the cells that you actually want to infect. So these could be U251s or 43s or whatever cell you want to infect and you put them in this plate. So you should have just detached them and put them in this plate. They should still be detached. You just trypsinize them and added them to this plate. And then you add on top of it two ml per well, usually of your virus containing media. And you spin this together. And spin it in a centrifuge for two hours and that really increases the contacts between your virus and your cells and it allows the virus to really get into the cells and then you take it out of the centrifuge and you let it be and you just let it be for like 48 to 72 hours and at this point you should have cells that have been transduced you can then select them with antibiotics usually with puromycin at a defined dose that's not going to just kill the cells and once you've completed the pyromycin treatment, you should have a population of selected and transduced cells. And this is the population that you should save and freeze and make stock of so that now you have a permanent batch of cells that has the right modification. So this is just another diagram that goes through it again. So three plasmids, they come together and form a virus. The virus leaves the 293 cell and it's put into the cell culture supernatant. 
we harvest that supernatant and use it to transduce cells of interest. So this is U251, 43, etc. And it goes in and it creates a permanent DNA modification. And that's what allows it to be stable. So every single cell that comes from this cell is going to have this DNA modification and therefore this new protein that we've made or whatever modification we've made. So this is a very key process. Make sure you understand it. And then once you have that stable population, you need to make sure that you check that it actually worked. So one way to check, like I said, is looking under the microscope for fluorescence, if it is a fluorescent marker. But you also have to go ahead and check by Western blot, which is preferred, or qPCR if you can't do a Western, in order to check that your modification happened. So if you were knocking down a protein, you want to make sure that it is actually sufficiently knocked down. Or if you were overexpressing a protein, you want to make sure that it is sufficiently overexpressed. And if your transduced cells are immortal, so if they're U251s, which is an immortalized line, you should always keep some going and always freeze them so that you have tons of cells to do experiments with. You don't have to go through this whole process again. If there are 43s or a PDX line, then you have to decide how worth it is to you that you actually propagate this line through flanks. And some people might say, this is a line I use all the time. I need this modification. I'm going to propagate it through flanks. And some people might say, you know, I'll free some stock. I'll use it for like the five passages that I can use it. And that will be the end of it. And then I'll have to redo the whole process. But if it is a U251 line, you have the option of keeping it forever. And you should. So a few key points to make here. One, I said that we talk about MOI. And so MOI stands for multiplicity of infection, which basically is a ratio of virus particles to cells. And so you can see here some examples of how this is calculated. A typical MOI is somewhere between 5 and 20 is usually enough to infect your cells. The second thing is the antibiotic selection. So you don't have to do this selection. If you have very high transduction efficiency, like 70-80%, and it's enough to get your experiment to work, maybe you decide that you don't want to expose the cells to further antibiotics. But if you really want that truly pure population, then it's a good idea to do the antibiotic selection. And so this is basically the idea that when you transduce, not every cell is going to take up your virus. So some cells will still never have the virus. And if you treat with pyromycin, you can get rid of those cells. And so now you have a truly pure population. And that just means that every cell is expressing your modification. And so it'll be much higher efficiency and a much better change. The other thing that's nice to have is a fluorescence marker. So this is like you have your promoter and then you have your modification and then you have a GFP marker. And this promoter is driving both. So if your modification is being expressed and your GFP is also being expressed, and so this is just nice because then when you infect your cells with your virus, you can just look under the microscope and you can see how much GFP there is. And that will tell you how good your infection was before you go ahead and run an entire Western and qPCR sort of blind. And it'll also allow you to see like once you run one Western and you've seen what that fluorescence looked like, in the future you can just look at the fluorescence and know whether your infection worked or not. So it's a very, very nice thing to have. And plasmids don't always contain them, so it's nice to order ones that do have fluorescence, ideally one your microscope can see easily, so order based on your microscope. And then they'll always contain antibiotic markers to allow for the selection, but the fluorescence is something you kind of have to look for and add on. So I've put this here as a reference. This really just has all of the details that you need to pay attention to as well as some key pause points and some critical points to pay attention to as you're doing this. I will leave this here for your reference. You can pause the video and read it through and make sure that you understand all the details. And also a lot of this is provided as a protocol on our website that you can look at. But I think the key points I wanna make is to pay attention to these pause points and these critical points and then to make sure that your X293s are very, very high quality when you use them. And then the other thing is to make sure that you always maintain a consistent supply of reagents. So you wanna make sure if you're doing this process over and over again, 
that you don't get stuck with having to start right from the beginning because then it's a nine-day process. But if you keep a constant stock of plasmid going and you always midi prep fresh plasmid when you notice that you're running out and you keep a constant stock of virus going and a constant stock of 293s going, then if you suddenly run out of your knockdown cells or something goes wrong with your knockdown cells, you already have the virus created. And so it's just a two-day process to make new virus or to make new knockdown cells. So try to always keep a stock of everything going so that you don't have to go back to the very beginning. That's sort of the biggest thing here to keep in mind. But the first time you do it, you will have to go from the top and do every step and make sure everything actually works. And then at the end of this, you will have to Western blot to check. And so that will add another three to four days to this protocol. These are some notes on troubleshooting. And so usually the problem with a modification is that it's low efficiency, that it didn't work or the knockdown isn't there or it's there, but it's barely there. And so the things to keep in mind for fixing that would be to make sure that your virus is very high quality. And so you should titer your virus and check how good the titer is. But also things that might cause a low titer would be things like having low quality X293s, maybe they're very high passage, so greater than P10, maybe they're very clumped, maybe they're not confluent enough, maybe you're not changing the media correctly, or they got contaminated or overgrown. These are easy cells to grow, but this process of transfection is very finicky. You need to make sure that everything is exactly perfectly the way it needs to be in order to get this good quality virus. So this is a place to be very careful. Another thing that could be going wrong is that you're just not adding enough virus. So if 2 ml isn't enough, you might consider going to 3 or 4 ml in your plate in order to get a good knockdown. You should also make sure that the cells you're transducing are healthy and are willing to take the transduction. Polybrain can sometimes help with stubborn cells. And then finally, your cells might be highly sensitive to centrifugation. So some cells just don't like being spun. And in that case, you can try running a negative control to check. And then you can try stationary infections because your cells might just not tolerate spinning very well. So in this video, we've talked about how to generate a gene modification. We've talked about some of the step-by-step -step things that you need to do and the things to keep in mind. Um, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me or to the lab. And if you want to see more content like this, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for listening.